Hello, welcome back to the GM's Guide. I'm your host, Dan Felder, your kind and merciful GM. If you appreciate this podcast, I'd certainly appreciate your leaving a five-star review or just sharing it with a friend. You can also ask me questions on Twitter at DesignerDanF. In today's episode, we continue following the step-by-step creation of my favorite campaign, Raven Shadow. If you're tuning in for the first time, you'll probably want to hop back to episode 21 where this whole thing started. For the rest of us, when we had left off, I had just received Chad's character questionnaire. I'd also mentioned that I was feeling some serious trepidation about working with him in the campaign. This is because while Chad is an absolutely awesome player, and I invited him to the game for a reason, the types of characters he enjoys portraying are anti-heroes. Antihero is a term that gets thrown around a lot, and it's often very vague, but the most useful definition I've heard is that an antihero is a protagonist, or one of the allies of a protagonist, who happens to lack the qualities of a classic hero. So again, they're a protagonist, or the ally of a protagonist, you know, characters that you would expect to have heroic qualities, who do not have the heroic qualities that are usually associated with heroes, but are not necessary for heroes for the story. Antiheroes are often cruel, dishonest, sleazy, shallow, or sometimes flat-out serial killers, like in the excellent show Dexter. To quote a line from, from a villain convention in Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series, one of the villain protests inviting Kaiba, who is the main character's rival, by saying, He's not a villain, he's an antihero! They give us villains a good name! Now, Chad's favorite type of antiheroes tend to use dark powers or come from supernaturally evil origins. He enjoys playing characters like Lucifer from the show Lucifer, in which the actual devil helps the police solve crimes. So, what do you not associate with a classic hero? Well, being the devil is a good start for an antihero. Another example would be like Alucard from Helsing, in which the monstrous Dracula, and they show him being very, very monstrous, helps hunt other supernatural evils who are even worse than he is. Now, in many campaigns, this type of character adds some enjoyable variety to the party. Dexter is the story about a serial killer who hunts other serial killers. Without his own nature as a killer, Dexter would be actually just kind of a rather generic cop show. Dexter's unusual situation gives the show new territory to play in and makes a classic hunt for a murderer feel fresh again. Unfortunately, antiheroes, and specifically those who use dark powers, as Chad always prefers in my experience have no place in this particular campaign. If Chad does what he usually enjoys, his character is going to get punished for it. That's a rule I've outlined already. And the Jester Nikolai's own story was built as an example for this. Nikolai was a compassionate and heroic character who took on dark powers for the best of all reasons, and as intelligently as you possibly could. He gave his paladin friend, Sir Brecton, an amulet that should allow him to kill Nikolai when the corruption finally came. The amulet was made from Nikolai's own power, was going to give Sir Brecton some protection from that power, and even that didn't work. The whole world wept for what the jester ended up becoming, which helps prove my theme. If virtue is worth walking through fire, taking the path of the lesser evil has to result in outcomes far worse than the flames. The ends can't justify the means. Otherwise, my setting will collapse. It's a rule of my setting that heroic characters that try to use dark powers or compromise with the darkness always end up regretting it, or else becoming so insane and corrupted that they can't regret anything anymore. That doesn't bode well for Chad. Now, some listeners might be wondering, hey, aren't rules made to be broken? Didn't you say yourself in episode 3 that interesting characters are an exception to a rule? Why can't you let Chad be an exception? Wouldn't that make him more interesting? Now, normally, this is absolutely correct. Most rules are literally made to be broken when you're setting up a setting. One reason you establish red dragons as evil, arrogant, and bloodthirsty is so that you can make a character like Scarlet, a red dragon who is sweet, shy, and deeply compassionate. Breaking this rule defies your audience's expectations, and we're hardwired, as I talked about back in the Creating NPCs episode, I think that's episode 3, to pay attention to things that break our expectations. This makes us curious about the character, and makes us interested in the character, which, which translates to emotional investments, which translates usually to liking the character and finding them memorable. 
So why isn't this the case for Chad and Raven's shadow? The answer lies in architecture. Let's say you're thinking about remodeling a house. Maybe you'd like to remove the wall between the dining room and the kitchen. you just like a bigger room overall. Now before you do that, you need to find out if this is a load-bearing wall. You see, while some walls can be removed safely, load-bearing walls are what actually hold up the roof or the upper floor or anything else important to hold up. If you take out, if you take out a load-bearing wall, the house is probably going to collapse on top of you. The fact that the, character, the ends don't justify the means when it comes to dealing with dark powers in my setting, this is a load-bearing rule. It's essential to my campaign's theme that when it comes to dark magic, the ends never justify the means. If I have a protagonist character acting as living proof that this rule isn't really true, it's more of a guideline, my whole theme is going to collapse. Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi is all about a struggle for Luke's soul. Will he fall to the dark side? Whenever Luke gives in to anger on screen, we see the danger of him following the wrong path, and we know where that path leads. We've seen it with Darth Vader, we've seen it with the Emperor. It leads to tyranny, murder, and despair. Now, imagine that Leia has actually been using the dark side of the Force through all three movies. Few scenes go by without her throwing Sith lightning or Force choking the bad guys. Throughout this, she continues to be a Force for good. Suddenly, all those speeches from Yoda and Obi-Wan about the dangers of the dark side sound more like prejudice than wisdom. Stop calling Leia evil. Clearly this is all a parallel to racism or something. Suddenly we're a lot less invested in whether Luke will actually fall to the dark side, because we've already seen that it's possible to use dark powers without becoming a monster. Why should we worry about Luke? Why should we worry about Luke? If Chad's living proof that dark powers can be used for good, why should we worry about all the thematic struggles going on in the rest of the story, which, by the way, are super important to Nathan's own heroic arc? If we give Chad this exception, we're going to undermine the rest of the setting and Nathan's own story. That's not acceptable. This is a load-bearing rule. It goes against my core themes. Okay, enough setup. Let's dig into Chad's actual character questionnaire. The moment I opened it, I was struck by the sheer length of it. Just the questionnaire was five pages long, just answering the 15 questions that I'd sent out. And remember, some of those were single-sentence answers. They specified, in one sentence, answer this question. So the character he created was named Cyrus. Here's Chad's one-sentence description of his character. Cyrus is a man torn between what he feels is right and what he has been told is right, who desperately needs to remind himself that he is alive. Okay, that's, that's pretty vague. Let me give him a more complete picture of the character myself. Remember, I'm looking for two things at this point. First, how will the character change over the course of the story? Second, what is the character's most powerful desire that will take them all the way from their character's starting point to their ending point changed at the end of the story? Here's what we're working with. Cyrus is tainted by dark magic. He was hunting a young white dragon with a necromancer one day, like you do. It's basically a mercenary's average Tuesday, I assume, in Raven's Walk. And it didn't go so well. They killed the dragon, but the dragon nearly killed both of them in the process. The necromancer used the dragon's blood to turn Cyrus into a reaver in order to save his life. Now, a reaver is a living person who has been infused with dark power via a blood ritual. Because this ceremony used the blood of an ice dragon... Cyrus's own dark powers are extremely powerful and carry an icy theme. Now, being a reaver has side effects. Cyrus is constantly driven by a joy of killing. He enjoys making creatures suffer. Innocent or not. Naturally, his conscious mind is repulsed by these sick desires. He deeply worries that he's evil because of what he feels and because of what he's become. Consequently, Cyrus attempts to act heroically whenever possible, because he wants to prove to himself that he's not evil. In terms of motivation, we've actually got a really great one. It's vague, but it's strong. Cyrus's sense of identity is on the line. He believes he may be a monster and desperately wants to prove to himself that he isn't. This drives him to take heroic actions to compensate for his inner drives similar to how a secret alcoholic might crusade for prohibition. 
She feels guilt for his own urges and tries to drown them out with heroic action. This is a really interesting motivation to act heroically, and it makes a GM's life actually really easy. Why would Cyrus want to help a group of townsfolk? Well, because that's what heroes do. See, he's not a monster. Even though he really wanted to murder those poor people himself, he's not a monster, and I'll prove it by saving you all. And then really probably won't kill you all, because I want to, but I'm not a monster. Now, unfortunately, this is a very vague goal, as I mentioned before. In fact, this core conflict makes for a terrible, terrible role-playing experience. Terrible. Inner conflict like this works in two distinct cases. The first is when you're witnessing another character's inner conflict, which is basically arguing with yourself, and are in suspense about what they're going to do. It goes to Macbeth. You see Macbeth conflicted about murdering his friend, and you desperately hope that he won't do it. It's as hypnotizing as watching someone on the edge of a building, pondering a jump to their death. You find yourself thinking, stop, don't jump, the same way you think in a horror movie, don't go in the basement, don't go in the basement. You don't know what they're going to decide, and you're hoping that they will turn back, or do the, what you think is right. Sometimes you want them to take the plunge. Depends on what they're jumping to. Whether it's a swimming pool, and they're trying to work up the courage, or whether it's their death, and you probably don't want them to do that. Now, the second way inner conflict works is when the player himself is experiencing that conflict. Wrestling with genuine moral dilemmas has fascinated philosophers for centuries. Bioware and Telltale Games are two companies that do a great job of putting the player in situations where they have to make difficult decisions. Do you stand up for your sister's honor in the face of your new lord who you, when you desperately need his approval? That's a very difficult decision, and it feels meaningful to make it. However, Cyrus's inner conflict doesn't work in either situation. Cyrus consciously wants one thing and instinctively wants something else. Again, he consciously wants one thing and instinctively wants something else. Chad won't be in suspense while making these decisions because he has complete control over his character's actions. He doesn't need to lean forward in his seat and pray that Cyrus won't kill an innocent because he knows he gets to decide whether they're going to kill an innocent or not. Meanwhile, Chad will not be experiencing that inner conflict for himself. Chad doesn't want to kill people. He won't feel Cyrus's dark pull that Cyrus would be feeling himself. He's just intellectually aware that Cyrus would be feeling a dark pull. He's not feeling it himself. It's the difference between being knowing that Antarctic is cold and that your character would be cold and feeling cold yourself, the actual bone-biting cold yourself. Imagine that you you have a character that's in some really cold environment and you know that they need to go through the snow, through this horrible cold for like 20 minutes in order to get something really important. Now consciously you know it's really important for your character to get this thing. You might need this thing to help accomplish a goal, to get a job, to defeat a big bad, any number of things. But on the other hand, you know it's really cold out and your character might not want to go through that cold. This is the inner conflict that Chad's going to basically be experiencing. He consciously is engaged with, okay, we want this thing for this reason, I want to go out in the cold for that reason, but my character would be feeling bad about it. So they consciously would probably want to stay inside. This is not a very compelling conflict to act out. There's no mental argument to be had, just the acknowledgement of an instinctive feeling that you can't replicate yourself. Chad might end up consciously wanting his character to be a hero and wanting all the things his character is going to want, but because Chad doesn't want to kill people, he won't feel Cyrus's dark desires. There's no actual inner conflict for him to experience. Consequently, while Cyrus would make a great protagonist for a novel, just great, he fails miserably as a player character, as a PC. Things get even harder when you consider Chad's intentions for Cyrus's character arc. In response to the question, what are two ways you could see your character changing over the course of the campaign? Chad wrote this. I can easily see him learning to embrace his power and no longer being conflicted about enjoying what he is and what he does. That doesn't mean he'd become evil, but he'd funnel his love for fighting and killing towards productive activities. Again, this is very dexter -y. Now, loving to kill will always be something that he leaves him a little screwy in the head. But a self-acceptance plot is what I see as the good ending, one that leaves him with a bit of pride at what he is. 
The other way I can see it going is if he decides to forsake his powers because of how they make him act and feel, and he attempts to find a cure for the curse. In short, Chad expects Cyrus to learn that the darkness isn't actually a bad thing. In fact, to be proud of himself as a vessel of darkness. Born This Way works as a Lady Gaga song about self-acceptance. It's a powerful message in the right story. However, it's completely out of place in Raven Shadow. It goes against the core themes. You don't want the Dark Sith Lord to learn self-acceptance. Worse yet, Chad disagrees with his character. This is a huge problem for most players. Chad disagrees with his character. Now, it's very difficult to get emotionally invested in an RPG when you and your character want different things, or have different opinions about those things. You either make a decision that is out of character, throwing off the story, because you do what you want, even though your character doesn't want to do it, or you make a decision that you are unhappy with, but it feels in character for your, for your character. And that can kill your emotional investment. Of course it can, because you're not happy about the decision you just made. Now, we need to resolve this. I can see a clear, powerful ending for Chad's character. The second option he mentions in passing. Cyrus starts corrupted, using dark magic and wondering if he's damned. He ends the story as far removed from that as possible, having thrown off his curse and now a vessel of holy light, sure of his purpose and having embraced heroism because it's right, and not because he feels like he must do it out of guilt. Having embraced heroism because it's right, and not because he feels guilty about wanting to embrace evil. But this ending will not work if Chad doesn't agree with it. If Chad thinks there's nothing wrong with the dark side, seeing his character give up that cool dark dragon ice power is going to feel lame. Now, for this character arc to work, I need to change Chad's own mind about what's right and wrong. I need to get Chad on an emotional level, not just arguing about it, but get him to really truly believe it deep down that the darkness in Raven Shadow truly is something to be resisted. Not to take pride in, not to be embraced. I need Chad to want to resist the darkness. Stated like that, the challenges become clear. First, Cyrus's inner conflict needs to be presented in a way that is fun to portray in an RPG. This probably means manifesting it externally, the way I already did with Nathan's own guilty conscience in the previous episode. But creating an external figure that wants to seduce Cyrus to the dark side... Cyrus's struggles against temptation can be dramatized the same way that Luke Skywalker's were. Resisting Darth Vader and the Emperor becomes an external symbol of Luke's own struggle against the allure of the dark side. Luckily, I've got just the character to do this. The Shade serves as the personified consciousness of all the shadows in Raven's Walk. He's the figure that whispers in the ears of the lords and gets them to go evil. The Shade is Raven Shadow's version of the devil, the ultimate tempter and moral adversary. He tempts people along the path to darkness and gains great joy from the corruption of heroes. If he were to take a special interest in Cyrus, Chad could experience the temptations of power offered by the Shade. Players like power and riches, so this kind of offering could work wonders in getting Chad to feel a similar call to the dark actions as Cyrus would feel. Different reasons, of course, but the inner conflict between raw desire and fear of the consequences would be very similar. In some ways, Chad's current belief that the dark powers are not evil is stronger than Cyrus's own evil urges, making him wanting to embrace them. Chad wants his character to be heroic. Cyrus wants to be heroic. Cyrus is currently pulled to darkness because of an instinct, whereas Chad is pulled to it because he thinks it's cool, and he wants his character to ultimately embrace it. If I can get Chad to realize the error of his path in this setting, and choose to resist what once seemed so attractive to him, and really buy into that, really experience that growth and change, that's going to be the phenomenal parallel to Cyrus's own ultimate rejection of the dark desires that pull him along the path of shadow. 
Here's what I ended up writing with for the progressive conflict section of Cyrus's plot development. Uh, his plot document, I mean. Progressive conflict. Tempt him to become the monster that he fears becoming. The shadows are his personal antagonist. They desire to mold him as the new master of the island, attempting to convert him to darkness the same way a Sith might convert a new student. The conflict is driven by his desire to be heroic, and the shadows desire for him to become a villain. We'll push him into situations where the corrupt route looks tempting indeed, and his murderous rage puts him into situations where he might accidentally kill innocents. We screw with his mind and make him stride toward the role of a villain, but savagely punish his submission to those temptations and reward his heroic stands against the corruption when he makes them. Throughout the campaign, repeatedly establish the deals with dark powers never, ever end well. Portray those own dark powers in ways that Chad will personally disdain. Chad should not want to join the evil League of Evil, and when they offer him a membership, his personal desire to deny them should help change Chad's own perspective of darkness and raven shadow. That last part is key. I need Chad to reject the darkness despite how cool it looks at first. Now to do that, I'm going to make the shade take a personal interest in him and have the shade act in ways that would make Chad want to resist him however he can. Since the shade is serving as his tempter, this will make Chad want to resist the temptation as well. The same way that if you have a really annoying salesman or someone else you really don't want to do business with at your doorstep, it makes what they're selling you that much more uh, colored by their own personality. This technique ends up working extremely well. Chad ends up loving the campaign. He wanted a sequel so much that he actually th ended up physically threatening me if I refused to run one. However, he later commented that his original concept ended up not working very well, and he apologized for changing his direction mid-campaign. This is the first time I've publicly revealed the truth. This change wasn't a mistake. I was counting on it and trying to create it. Having the Shade specifically interested in corrupting Cyrus and willing to manipulate events to make that happen, that also made the conflict more personal. A general desire to be heroic can manifest in lots of different ways. I wanted Cyrus's main drive in the campaign as personal as possible, so it truly feels like his story, that he belongs here. Not just anyone with a cool sword and maybe a dark's past. So why was the Shade so specifically interested in Cyrus? What about Cyrus could be special? The easy answer are Cyrus's unique powers, right? Dark blood magic born from an ice dragon? That might be unique enough to interest a Shade, or might be unique enough to interest anyone. But, there's a, but that's a relatively weak connection. Cyrus just happens to be the guy attached to those powers, which he gained through no choices of his own. They influence his current struggle, but they don't say anything about who he is. Cyrus's character is all about his personal identity. I wanted to reach deeper into the character's identity to create an even stronger motivation for the shade in the process. Cyrus's arc is all about self-identity. The reason the shade is interested in him should have to do with his personal identity as well. So what are the, the real touchstones of our personal identity? What are the real touchstones of our personal identity? After a few pages of ideas sprinkled through a brainstorming document, I find a note as I'm reviewing this, typed in all caps. What if Cyrus is descended from Sir Brecton? This works perfectly. Cyrus is torn between the monstrous nature of his magic and his pull toward the light. If he's descended from the greatest paladin in Raven Shadow's history and one uniquely relevant to the setting as the Jester's best friend, the one who ultimately was betrayed, and whose spirit still resides in the shrine just outside the Jester's castle, who I'm planning the players to eventually meet. Cyrus can hardly be more important to the story. He belongs here more than nearly anyone else, except maybe, maybe Nathan, who seems to have equal claim because, you know, his old wife's kind of running the place right now. 
Now, the Shade would naturally want to corrupt this noble bloodline. He always likes corrupting heroes. That's what he does. But can we make this more important? One thing that works so well in the original Star Wars trilogy is that the choices of one Jedi can make all the difference between the reign of the Empire and the rise of the Rebellion. This is one reason I like that low Jedi, rare Jedi, no Jedi setting so much more than the old Republic uh, era, because it's really portrayed that the choices of one Jedi, they're so special and important that whole empires can sway over whether Luke Skyrock Skywalker is joining the Empire or not. This sort of a joke, saying that, you know, uh, the Emp Emperor seems really focused on whether, you know, Luke Skywalker is joining him or not, but it's presented as that important. It's that important. So, Luke's struggle for his soul has huge and obvious ramifications for the setting. His failure means the Empire will win. His triumph means we'll see the return of the Jedi and the fall of the Empire itself. I want something similar for Cyrus. What's the equivalent of the light of hope going out in Raven Shadow? Well, the answer is pretty simple, right? The loss of all hallowed ground. Points of hallowed ground are literally points of light in the setting. They're the places where noble heroes die heroic deaths. Their blood hallows the site where they fell, creating a place where supernatural evils, the shadow magics, cannot enter. Hallowed ground is permanent. It never fades. It's the ultimate representation of my theme, of a heroic legacy living on, that choosing the virtuous path was ultimately worth it. And that's my theme. Virtue is worth the sacrifice. It's worth walking through fire. And that your sacrifice will protect people until the end of time. Hallowed ground is the light of hope for a terrified traveler. Imagine seeing that light go out. How can I possibly tie Cyrus to this unthinkable change? Corrupting hallowed ground can't be easy. It can't even be possible, really, without destroying the theme. It would invalidate that hero's sacrifice. I needed to tie Cyrus's corruption to the loss of hallowed ground, but without betraying the theme. What if we make a little change to the history of the setting? What if Sir Brecton didn't just create a patch of hallowed ground when he died outside the Jester's castle? What if he created the first patch of hallowed ground? Sir Brecton died in very interesting circumstances. If you recall, he was wearing the amulet Nikolai gave him at the time, the amulet that shielded him from Nikolai's powers. A noble paladin's death, combined with an item made from the Shadow's own magic to repel their powers... I can imagine how that combination of interesting events could create hallowed ground from the start. We'll say that Sir Brecton's death sent ripples of light throughout the setting, disturbing the very nature of the islands. Only after his death did other heroes begin creating hallowed ground as well. As you can imagine, the Shade was furious. His perfect darkness is being pierced by points of light that even he can't enter. But he can't get rid of them. He has no power over them. That's the point. However, they're only sanctified by the noble sacrifice of a hero. If that hero was to become corrupted, they, their death wouldn't have hallowed it in the first place. If the blood of Sir Brecton created hallowed ground itself, the very magical nature of it, then might that same blood, corrupted by shadows, not dispel it? If Cyrus is the blood of Sir Brecton, his own corruption and then bloody death might be enough to end the hallow forever. This gives the Shade a very interesting relationship with Cyrus. While Cyrus is ignorant of the legacy he carries, the Shade will see the descendant of his most hated foe, and also the one person whose corruption might finally purge the hallow from his lands. He hates Cyrus and wants to torment him more than anyone. Anyone. Except Sir Brecton himself. And how sweet would it be to see the paladin spirit's face when his own flesh and blood ultimately betrays his ideals and undoes his sacrifice. That is powerful. Now, I'm not going to tell the players that Sir Brecton is the cause of All Hallow. I'll let them discover that. 
throughout the course of the setting. There'll be a big reveal that only later, later will they realize why Chad is getting such a particularly specific interest from the shade. Now, there's an obvious plot hole, of course, but you can plug those as long as you see them coming. Naturally, if Sir Brecton's descendants have existed for thousands of years, why is it only now that the Shade is trying to corrupt one? Him trying and failing for thousands of years to corrupt, you know, all the descendants would make him seem wily coyote levels of ineffectual. No, I want a strong reason that it has to be Cyrus, and a strong reason why the Shade could not have corrupted anyone else. So this is the first time he has gotten a chance to corrupt somebody. And also the last. If Cyrus resisting the temptation means that, that no one, no one at the end of the campaign will ever risk ending all hallowed ground again, my setting's themes will remain intact. And it will mean so much more when he ultimately becomes a noble paladin like Sir Brecton before him. The dragon blood magic of Cyrus is a tempting explanation. It's something that makes him obviously dark magic-y and obviously uh, unique but it seems too academic. The solution is frankly simpler than that. The Shade has been trapped with the Jester all this time. Now, previously, I'd been imagining that the Shade was still the rest of Raven Shadow doing his thing while the Jester slumbered in the shadow fell. But let's say that we change that. The Shade isn't something your average person needs to know about. It's possible that when the Jester took his island out of the world, which is the island, as I mentioned, where the Shade's manor is, that he took the Shade with him. Sir Brecton's children obviously weren't on the Jester's Isle, so the Shade could not have corrupted any of them. Now is his first chance, and Cyrus is going to be sailing right up to his manor, already half corrupted. However, this doesn't explain why Cyrus denying the Shade would end the threat forever. What about his kid or his parents? It's pretty weak to just say, oh, his parents are dead and he won't have kids or they'll be real careful. I want a more permanent and emotionally powerful guarantee that at the climax of the campaign, the Hollow is no longer under threat of corruption. After all, threatening its permanence in the setting is a huge thematic risk. It says virtue is ultimately worth it, uh, unless something goes wrong. It puts an asterisk on every heroic sacrifice going forward. I need that asterisk gone by the campaign's conclusion. Again, the solution is extremely simple. As long as there are shadows in Raven's Walk, the danger will exist. That's the problem. That's my issue here. There are no happy endings in Raven's Walk. The best you can hope for is a triumphant tragedy. The shadows make sure of that. There's no winning in the end. There's no happy ending. We need to banish the shade and all the shadows from the entire setting. That's the only way we're going to get our happily ever after. How could the heroes do that? What would make sense? Perhaps Nikolai himself could be redeemed. He's very important to the setting, the ultimate lord and master of the shadows. The Shade's his puppet master, of course, but Nikolai's a big figure. Maybe his sacrifice um, would hollow the entire island chain. Maybe he could be redeemed, similar to Darth Vader's own final repentance. That's interesting and a fitting end for the character. I'll keep it in mind, and I certainly made a note of it when I thought of it. But I want something more powerful than that. I want something more powerful than that. More than another heroic death. How can we bring the islands into the light? How about literally? What if the players literally end the campaign by bringing the islands into the sunlight? A while ago, I was watching Spoonie's excellent retrospective on the Ultima role-playing game series. I highly recommend checking it out. In Ultima 8, you go to a dark world already conquered by the evil god you were resisting in Ultima 7. The game is utterly terrible, but it has some interesting ideas, one of which is that the world has never seen the sun. The world you go to in Ultima 8 has never seen the sun. What if it's always night in Raven's Walk? What if this shade and his dark magics can't endure the glare of natural sunlight? I put together a concept by which the Shade made a bargain with the gods a long, long time ago to help in their war against the elemental powers. That's something called the Dawn War that's at the basis of the 4th edition D&D setting. The gods' end of the bargain was to create a cloud layer over part of the island chain that blocked out all sunlight. 
this would be the domain of shadows in the mortal realms. If sunlight were to shine through, the shadows would be driven away, which is why they need this impenetrable cloud cover. This would also purify anything of shadow wrought powers. If the players were to lift the islands over the cloud layer, it would be an instant end to the shade, and it would also dispel all the terrible magics he'd wrought over the centuries. All the curses are gone. And how beautiful an image would that be? To literally lift up the innocent victims inhabiting these islands and show them their first sunrise. I don't know how they can pull it off, but I desperately want to see them try. That's an amazing image, and I can find a way for it to work by the end of the campaign. Thanks for listening. We didn't have time for our fourth character, Baloran, today, because Chad's character took a lot of time. I actually cut out about 20 minutes discussing the relative strengths of various mediums and portraying different kinds of character conflicts, and a whole bunch of other stuff related to the struggles with Chad's character. So when we return, we're going to flesh out the rest of his character, our fourth, final member of the group, and we're going to start really bringing Raven Shadow to life. We're going, to start, we're going to start creating the musical culture of it, the naming culture, all the elements that are the stories, the plays, all the elements that make a whole world that usually go ignored. I want the setting to breathe. I want it to really feel alive, rich, and constantly reinforced through various soundtracks. I do that when I build campaigns, and I built a whole soundtrack for Raven Shadow. And I want it to feel like every moment that you're hearing stories from villagers or encountering strange tales or listening to the music play as you're on your travels in the background as I'm playing with my soundtrack on the computer, that everything feels connected and cohesive in building the theme and feel of this world. I want this place to be a setting that rewards full citizenship. And that feels like if you look around the corner... There's going to be something there. See you next time.